This episode is brought to you by Fully Gemstones. She always wears her brooches with with great thoughtfulness, and she chooses the pieces according to the event and its significance, both for herself and her audience. And there's a particular Grima piece um, with rubies, which Prince Philip gave her from this mid-60s moment, which obviously means a great deal to her because of the way that she wears it and the occasions on which she wears it. Welcome to If Jewels Could Talk. I'm Carol Walton, the voice of jewellery, an author, broadcaster, and the woman who initiated the role of jewellery editor at magazines like Tatler and British Vogue. This is a podcast for everyone, for people who do like jewellery, for people who don't realise they like jewellery, and anyone intrigued by fascinating facts, new ideas, and forgotten histories. So please join me as I tell sparkly tales, meeting all sorts of people, delving into four centuries of jewellery culture, and investigate what's happening now. This episode was recorded before the sad death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and we will poignantly be talking about the last jewel created for her that she wore over her Platinum Jubilee celebrations at one of her last public appearances. First, we're going to talk about 40 Years, 40 Makers, which is an exhibition exploring the Goldsmiths Company collection with Dr Dora Thornton. So please join me at the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths. I'm in the City of London this morning. You can probably hear the sounds of the city getting to work. I'm visiting one of the 12 great livery companies of the City of London. The Goldsmiths, the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths, who received their first royal charter in 1327. It was when King Edward I passed a statue requiring gold and silver to be of a defined standard, requiring guardians of the craft. And that's what the Goldsmiths Hall has been ever since. They test gold and silver and mark it with a leopard's head. And this has stayed the home of hallmarking ever since. People in Britain bring their wares to the hall to receive the hallmark. And it's been on this site in Foster Lane since... 1339 when 19 goldsmiths bought the hall for use of the company and this is where it still stands today this huge impressive building with great Corinthian columns and I'm going in this building was built in 1820 you can hear my feet maybe on the marble hallway the grandeur of the hall is astonishing there's a vast staircase drawing room with tapestries and marble fireplaces. So it's small wonder that the hall has stood in for Buckingham Palace in Netflix's show, The Crown. So welcome to If Jules Could Talk. I'm with Dr. Dora Thornton in Goldsmiths Hall, curator of the Goldsmiths Company Collection, formerly curator of the British Museum's Renaissance Europe Department, She's written widely about the applied arts and collecting from the Renaissance to the present day and is author of the book, The Brooch Unpinned, which we will be talking about a bit later. So first of all, will you tell us a little about the collection and how it started? It is an extraordinary collection of British craft, craft from around the world. It's mostly British. Uh, This collection is a very interesting assemblage of antique pieces that have been collected since about 1900 to show the development of the goldsmith trade in Britain. And then in 1926, we started collecting contemporary British silver, really as showpieces of excellence and to raise the standard of the trade. Um, And those are the pieces in this corner over here. And then we moved on to collecting more contemporary British silver. And our post-war collection is probably the best in the world of its kind because we have the most astonishing assemblage of pieces for many makers who can follow them from the very beginnings of their careers to the, to the end of their lives, and fantastic resource. Then in 1961, we started collecting modern jewellery, a completely new departure for us, and we have a really exciting collection of that, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, in a minute. And then from 1970s, but particularly 1990, we've collected modern art medals. 
And we also have domestic play, and that's the stuff that flies around the building and gets used in dinners and lunches and has a real working life here in the hall. And even the jewellery gets worn by senior officers of the company at events. So it's a very special kind of collection. It's a kind of working collection. It's a working collection that shows who we are and what we do as a company. And let me tell you all I can see under the bright neon lights is gold and silver reflecting. I mean, it's extraordinary over so many um, surfaces. It's that relationship between people and things that makes this such a very special collection and so unlike most museum collections. And I see all these huge candelabra because I have had dinner <laughs> in Goldsmiths Hall, in the Great Hall. And apart from these vast candelabra that are so tall and beautifully crafted, there are huge chandeliers that get lowered and candles get lit one by one. That's right. Each chandelier in the livery hall has something like 40-something candles which are individually lit. And then there are those huge pier glasses in the gilding frame. So, you know, the reflections of light off the silver and silver gilt surfaces, off mirrors, off the white linen, um, and then the incorporation of flowers as well. It just makes a magical environment mm. for people. So the hall originally started as an assay office to protect the purity of gold and silver. And then, latterly, it became something to protect craftsmen and the craft. Or was that from the very beginning? I think from the very beginning, it was a, a flagship, but also a place to preserve and keep, protect the trade, protect consumers police standards in the silversmithing and goldsmithing trade. So it's been that on this site over three different buildings for hundreds and hundreds of years, and we're coming up to 700 years. So we've been hallmarking on this site since 1478. So all the gold and silver um, made in London should have come here for its hallmarking, uh, which is quite a thought. So you're surrounded by pieces. And anything made abroad that wants to be sold in London, does that come here as well? Oh, I'm not quite sure how that's policed. Um, but gold and silver that is made in London comes here to be hallmarked, and that mm. still happens to this day. And that's an amazing continuity for us. And so I can show you a piece that was hallmarked in 1493 on this site. We can probably tell you the name of the warden who actually marked it. And put the incredible. leopard's head mark upside down, perhaps after a drunken lunch or something. I mean, the stories that we can tell, both with the objects and the archives, and the way we can interrelate them, is something really special. And they do talk. So they these do. pieces talk about that warden, about yes. that craftsman. Yes, they do. And so... Did the hall from the beginning buy exceptional pieces? No, that's something we just accumulated silver at the beginning. And of course, the Goldsmiths Company, until the Huguenot bankers sorted us out in the 1740s, um, our finances went up and down, up and down. And the first thing to go was always the silver. So if there was accumulated dining silver, it would get melted down for bullion to get us out of a difficult spot. And it was only in the 1740s when um, Charles Hosier turned up and balanced the books that we started investing in the very latest contemporary staff by the great Paul de Lamery, one of these immigrant craftsmen fleeing religious persecution in Europe. And immigrants have always been really important to the goldsmiths trade. That's not a new thing, that's always been the case. And we can show that in our collection. So from the 1740s, we started having a permanent display of the very latest and best silver. But we didn't really have a collection until the 1900s with this sort of antiquarian moment. So one of the tricky moments might have been when it burnt down during the Great Fire of London and you had to rebuild. There was a lot of reinvesting in silver with the restoration, and that we can show in our records and with the pieces. Um, famous things given by famous donors were literally remade, almost as fakes or replicas of pieces that had existed before. So the silver tells stories about people and their connection with the trade and about donors and about charity. So there are all these stories about people that come literally through the objects and through the archives. That's amazing, isn't it? Yes. Um, how many pieces do, do you have now in the collection? Oh, my or goodness. Do you know? <laughs> I ought to know off the top of my head, but I don't. But I think there was a, uh, something like 12,000 pieces, if you count every spoon and every fork, but 4,000 pieces of really, you know, top class things, I think you can say. And they're stored very, very carefully. Or do they have to have air? The air is filtered down here. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that there's cork linings on the walls, which also helps dehumidifiers. It's very carefully controlled environment to prevent 
tarnish building up on things, but we're always revisiting the collection and keeping things moving. And because it's a working collection, you know, a lot of the domestic silver is tended to by Charlie, our silver steward, you know, on a regular basis because it's used. So, Charlie, do you have to do all the cleaning? Oh, yes. yes <laughs> that must take you, like, a month to clean this. <laughs> oh, five minutes. <laughs> So you've got um, special silver polish by the bucket load down here. <laughs> We're very careful about what we do, but we do tend the things carefully. We're going to talk about, you've got a special exhibition this year that you've created, Dora, which is 40 Years, 40 Makers. Tell us from what point it starts, the 40 years, and why that's so special. Well, we do a display every year for Goldsmiths Fair, where we get out masterpieces of gold and silver and jewellery from the collection, really as touchstones of excellence for visitors. And the hope is that it's helped both for visitors who are thinking of making a purchase or a commission from the fair stallholders, but also helps the makers by showing their work at its very best and giving a sort of historical context for what they're seeing. And this year, we've got the 40th anniversary of Goldsmiths Fair, which is probably the most significant platform that the company offers to contemporary makers. It's a chance to have a stall and show your wares and meet the public directly. And it sets up that valuable series of conversations which may end in a purchase or a commission. So it's an incredibly important communication and marketing tool for makers and for the company. And so this year, to celebrate that 40 years, um, we've taken 40 makers from the collection, each represented by one piece each made over that period, so from 1983 to now. And it shows a really interesting amount of diversity of techniques but also personalities um, personalities and progression too because you can really see new technologies coming in you can see women coming in at the top end of the trade in great numbers in from around 2000 and the diversity that they bring mm -hmm. um, and it's less about jewelers because it's, the proportion of our collection would be 30 to 10 in this exhibition of silversmiths to jewelers but the jewellery that we've chosen, I think, works really, really well with the silver to say something about, you know, what can be done in precious metal. So what was the criteria for you to choose the jewellery? Was it about the style, the design, the technique, or all three together? It's really about all three together. It's really about showing each maker at their most characteristic through one piece, which is obviously a very difficult thing to do. But we can do it because we can represent very, very famous makers by showing something from very early in their career, which they are now revisiting in their making. So that's a really interesting thing. So who will the jewellers that you're representing in this be? Well, we have a wonderful Wendy Ramshaw with her beautiful song brooch. We have... So Emma Wendy Fer Ramshaw was one of the great modernist jewellers. Absolutely. And this is an astonishing piece that we commissioned from her. I think it was 2010, 2011, from her Drawings in Gold series. And it's literally a drawing in gold. Um, it's called Song. And I don't know about you, it's an abstracted design, but in a sense, I see a pianist at a piano. At a piano, there. definitely. And this is made from gold sheet and gold wire, so hand-pierced gold sheet and... And, and very light. Wire. Very light, and it's like wearing a drawing. And it's beautifully balanced on your body, so when you wear it, it, it sits perfectly. Mm. And we know Wendy Ramshaw's work mainly from her rings, her famous sets of rings that she created beautiful stands for. But she loved brooches as well, didn't she? She loved brooches. Um, we've just written a book about the rings in the collection, and, the, and her rings feature largely, so if anyone's interested in our astonishing collection of her rings, that's the place to go. But she's one of the great stars. And who else will you have? Well, one of the more recent, in fact, our, probably our most recent jewellery commission is this beautiful brooch, the Amory brooch by Emmeline Hastings, um, who is a, a much younger maker, and she specialises in embedding scales of precious metal into an acrylic ground. And this piece grew actually from Goldsmiths Fair. We saw a brooch quite like this in this series at Goldsmiths Fair, and we were so impressed by it, this was the Contemporary Craft Committee, that we commissioned her to make this brooch, but we gave her a challenge to develop her work. She was always interested in getting a kinetic feel and a, and a sense of movement in these scales that seem to move like feathers or scales um, in the light as light passes over them. But what we asked her to do was they're to very use... tactile. You think they're going to move. Exactly. There was a pivotal exhibition 
that sort of catapulted British Jewry into the modern era, wasn't that held by goldsmiths in the 60s. Can you tell us why that was so important? It was a very radical exhibition because it was a completely new concept, the International Exhibition of Modern Jewellery. And it was something that the v and originally wanted to do and they're brilliant curators. And it was originally an idea from the v and using their fantastic collections. But the idea was taken up by Graham Hughes, who was my predecessor here at the company, and he championed the exhibition. It happened here in Goldsmiths Hall. Thousands of people came. What it did was show the work of independent studio jewellers alongside the great jewellery houses, Cartier, etc., from 33 countries. And so it was incredibly exciting for some of these young designer makers who nobody knew about at the time. So someone like uh, Bjorn Wexlund from Finland had one ring in the collection in, and one ring in the exhibition. And he described to me in his 80s now how exciting it was to have your work literally taken from your hand and put in a case with Jean Arp and Picasso and Braque and all these great people. So you went home, he said, energised, and it helped him to break all the rules and start doing something completely different. So when he got home, he started moving into his famous Space Age jewellery, you know, the famous necklace that was worn by Princess Leia in Star Wars. So I think the exhibition had a role in unleashing the creativity of a lot of individuals. Well, you can't imagine Cartier and Bulgari taking part in any exhibition now with other makers, let alone craft makers. You just can't imagine it. It It just wouldn't be associated. It was a very bold idea to mix Mm. things up as much as that. And it gave a whole kickstart to art jewellery, designer jewellery, artist And it was particularly after they felt the industry had got a bit um, dowdy and stuck after the Second World War and they wanted to reinvigorate it. Absolutely. I mean, men and materials have been diverted, women too, you know, to the war effort. Mm. Uh, there was a huge high purchase tax on luxury goods. There were all kinds of things to sort of act as a break on innovation and creativity. And then there were all these young men coming back from, from the war, fired up with completely new ways of seeing and doing things. Like Andrew Greamer. Like Andrew Greamer, who brought his brilliant engineering skills, his Um, he'd been an engineer by training and then in the war he'd mended tanks and jeeps in the jungle in Burma where there were no spare parts so you you had to use your initiative you had to be really creative in never throwing anything away and reusing and he brought those brave bold skills to jewellery making and you can see the results in our collection and he really was the, the sort of spearhead of this new modernist British style, wasn't he? He was one of a series of people, most many of them not British, people who were just, you know, birds of passage passing through or who came to live here, who brought a completely new way of doing things to make jewellery modern. And that's what they did. And it was texturing unusual gemstones, using gemstones for the colour rather than the value. Absolutely. Abstract design. Absolutely. And you can see that on two fantastic brooches here. Um, This one... Uh, this one I know you're particularly fond of, the Desert Rose. This is a grey crystalline fossil, which is actually very skillfully embedded in a gold framework with these beautiful Pave diamond set tendrils, which seem to actually hold the piece. But when you turn it over, it's actually held very, very firmly on the back by this hinged uh, back frame, which you can take off for cleaning, or ever practical, you know, ever the engineer. <laughs> but it's a brilliant piece of construction, and it shows the wonderful rings of the fossil on the back. It's so something the stone is kept absolutely in its natural state, absolutely, but within this incredible jeweled frame. So it looks like seaweed tendrils growing around a fossil, something you might find underwater. Was this the one that won the Duke of Edinburgh's um, design award? For for elegance in 1966. This is one of a group of jewels mm. that did that. And of course, he was the first jeweller to win that coveted prize. And in the citation, I love um, yes. the remarks because it really brings alive that moment. It says, today the value attaching to creative design as distinct from the intrinsic value of the precious stones and metals has greatly increased. There's now a real difference in the value of jewels as their settings is compared with their breakup value. People now buy for beauty more than investment. Taste has moved towards more varied and less conventional styles, and this has encouraged the development of abstract and natural forms congenial to young designers. Yes, and 
uh, Graham Hughes, again, this man who did the 1961 exhibition and was so important in this movement in giving people the confidence to express mm. themselves and the chance to work with these materials. He said, boasting is out, beauty is in. It's not about diamonds. It's about these rough stones in their uncut state. It's about every kind of texturing and roughing up you can do in gold. And this is a really good example. So this is Grima using, um, again, a rough cut rose quartz, seemingly held by these beautiful Pave set diamond tendrils. But growing around like barnacles all the way around are these gold collets and very soft 22 karat gold. And these are what was returned to makers when they sent their stuff into the assay office because they used to remove a scrape to test the metal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And usually these pieces were just returned to the maker and they melt them down and use them again. But he's actually incorporated these little furls of gold and used them here to sort of encrust like barnacles all the way around the brooch. So that's just another example of his never throwing anything away and of seeing beauty in something which many people would have thought was just a throwaway thing. I think that encapsulates. He talks about how finding every way of roughing up and texturing gold that you could possibly use. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He wasn't the only one um, because people like John Donald yes. uh, were early on experimenting, even before the 1961 exhibition in the late 50s, he was bringing his stuff, the sort of thing he could afford, in here to Graham Hughes. And Graham Hughes was buying the pieces for the collection so he could go back and buy more metal and experiment because that's how hand-to-mouth a lot of this was. And this piece, which won a prize in 1962, is this amazing brooch made out of looks like a tumble of boulders of small gold blocks, some of them set with diamonds, um, textured on their side so as to catch the light, soldered end to end to make this really an incrustation. Mm. It's a like tiny little thing. gold and diamond Lego blocks. <laughs> haphazardly put together. It looks haphazard, but it's mm. so beautifully constructed. And what I think is again special about our collection is you can show the reverberation of all that 60s experimentation into the present. So someone like Jo Hayes Ward, who regularly shows at the fair, this is her development of, of that Donald idea, you might say. Certainly it's in conversation with the Donald piece from 1962. So this is a commission from, I think, 2011, in aluminium blocks. So it's very light and it's almost like an optical illusion. Yes, and it's a geodesic structure. So she's used this using um, computer-aided design and it has this, this very strong you know, modern technology look and it's very light. It almost seems to spring off your body. Um, but the way that the light catches those textured blocks is amazing. And then again, this is a much smaller version from her from 2018. Um, again, using this idea, not here, not blocks, but um, the sort of planks of gold and baguette diamonds textured and soldered at their edges um, to get this wonderful sense of structure. So again, talking back, using computer aided design, but talking back to that 60s experiment. But taking it forward for the future. Taking it into the And passage. we'll put some of these images on um, Instagram so people can see. That would be great. But I particularly wanted to, I mean, Talking about Andrew Greemer, and there's a lot of discussion when Her Majesty wears a Greemer brooch, which she does frequently. I think you've written about it, that um, her use of the brooch, particularly through the COVID pandemic, when she appeared wearing Greemer, yes. and what it meant. Yes, she always wears her brooches with, with great thoughtfulness, and she chooses the pieces according to the event and its significance, both for herself and her audience. And there's a particular Greemer piece um, with rubies, uh, engraved rubies and emeralds, which engraved rubies that she has, which Prince Philip gave her um, from this mid 60s moment, which obviously means a great deal to her because of the way that she wears it and the occasions on which she wears it. Um, we had the great privilege of commissioning a special brooch for her, which we can find for you, for her Platinum Jubilee, mm -hmm. which if you haven't seen, it would be a lovely thing to show, um, made by David Marshall in Hatton Garden. And we presented her with a um, short list of designers who were invited to submit designs and she chose this design and she it was slightly customized so it's designed in a swirl of white gold with the four flowers of the four nations England, Wales, So Charlie scurried Scotland, around. And Northern Ireland. <laughs> I hope you clean this one Charlie for us. <laughs> and there it is. 
<laughs> oh, it's so beautiful. It is an amazing sculptural piece. You can see the thistle, the daffodil, the rose and the shamrock. And the addition of the little lilies Lily. of the valley, which, which were in her coronation bouquet. And the swirls of the four nations are held by the seven bands, the, the bands for one for each year for her reign, mm -hmm. in a wonderful sculptural way. So when it's worn, it seems to catch the light most beautifully on the body. Has she worn it yet? She wore this um, at the Platinum Jubilee to our great delight to light the first of the Millennium Beacons, that series of beacons that went out across the UK and the Commonwealth, which was, of course, caught globally on television and a tremendous moment. Yeah. She wore it on a, on a turquoise costume. It's beautiful. So we were very, very honoured by that. And this is number two, so this is a copy of the one that she wore and that she still has. We were delighted right. to be able to present her with that. Now, brooches, I think, are particularly interesting. They're particularly talked about at the moment, I think, um, They've become almost a sort of political discussion, haven't they, with Madeleine Albright's book, Read My Pins, that people are really a lot into what people are wearing on their shoulder and assuming it's got a great meaning. And I just wanted to talk a minute about the origin of the brooch, because it really is one of the jewels that has a practical purpose. And then, well, and we, yes, I think it must have started with holding textile together on your body. Like a fastening, like yes. a buckle or a So something. it goes back a very long way. Um, and, but it, because it's, it's worn on textiles, it has this relationship with clothing, whereas a ring you wear against your skin. So they're very, very different forms of expression. And it's been very exciting looking first at brooches and then at rings to get the sense of how different those two designs can be, even in the hands of the same makers, same designers. I also think the brooch is kind of an unselfish jewel because yeah. it can speak about the identity of the wearer and their style, but also it's really for other people to see. So mm. it is this big statement when you walk in a room. You can, this is me. This is who I am on my shoulder. You can read and you know a bit about me before I've said a word. It's a conversation piece, definitely. And mm -hmm. you're using your body as a canvas, aren't you? Mm -hmm. um, and it's perhaps less about you than it is about the maker uh, and the, and the way that so? the viewer sees it. I, I think it can be a very personal accessory, but again, in a different way to a ring, which is almost an extension of the person's personality. Because this doesn't affix to the body, so it has exactly. got a world of its own. I think so. I think so. And although our pieces don't have overt political messages in the way that Madeleine Albright's pins mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. um, people really respond to that, or supposedly Baroness Hale Spider, uh, which started off a global conversation. And I think I, I was actually thinking about brooches before she wore that piece, but that piece certainly made me think it was a good subject to write about. She wore a big spider on the day that she had to announce that Boris Johnson's proroguing of Parliament was illegal. That's right. And everyone thought she's caught him in a web and this whole connotation of the spider. And ever since, people have been talking about brooches and what they mean. And I think what's interesting about the brooches that you're going to have on display is that so many people have this idea that brooches are a bit fusty, fuddy-duddy. Maybe a grandmother would wear them or an aunt. And this shows that they are extraordinarily avant-garde pieces of jewellery. They really are. And I think one of the ones that we've added fairly recently, which speaks to contemporary concerns in a really interesting way, is this, what I think all the gold scribble, really, um, Waves on Moonlight. It's a, it, Moonlight on Waves. It's a very, very beautiful piece. And this is made from fair trade gold. It's the first piece of fair trade gold in our collection, uh, made from gold from a mining cooperative in Macdesa, Peru, which is very important to her, her message about sustainability and fairness and, the, and the economy and the way that the gold trade works. It's also a fantastic piece to wear if you just hold that against your body. It just pins onto your clothing. You know, men and women can wear it. You can wear it on a t-shirt. You can wear it on a little black dress. It's, it can go anywhere and be seen in any context. Do you think we're too, we've got too stuck about where we wear brooches? Because we do pin them. I mean, it should be pinned high on your shoulder, shouldn't it? It should be high on your left shoulder. And Dora's <laughs> just showing me she's got this one. This is Joanne Thompson. This which is, is a lovely gold circle 
with what are these? These are, these little, are little gold links. Little gold links, which are almost which woven together so they move. move. So high on your left shoulder. But do you think we should be a bit more inventive and wear them in different places as well? Like Jacqueline Onassis used to wear one up in her hair. Yes. Sharon Stone on her hip. Yes. Um, they can, can actually go anywhere. Can't you can they? wear them anyhow, as long as they're well balanced and the pins work. And that's something which I explored in my book. I was very concerned to show. It was called the brooch arm pinned. And both in the exhibition and the book, we show you the back of each piece because any maker or jeweller seeing one of these brooches immediately looks at the back to see how the thing is constructed, how the engineering works. And these are pieces of micro-engineering. It needs to balance well in your body so as not to get caught in other things and to show itself at best advantage and for you to feel really comfortable in wearing it. So first advice on choosing a brooch is look at the back, look at the construction, look at how the pin works. To make sure it will balance. To make sure it balances. Do you well think our body. fabrics, maybe why we've got to think of new places to wear them is because our fabrics are too thin sometimes to support them? Well, it's very noticeable with some of the earlier pieces, particularly the 60s pieces, that they do demand much uh, heavier fabrics, tweed or, or thicker cloth to be worn on. And of course, that's not the case now. People want to wear really much more flimsy textiles. Yeah. So yes, that is something definitely to think about. When you think of Boudicca, who apparently... Roman historian said she had a huge brooch pushing, um, keeping her mantle together. You think, you know, these would not, A, have managed to clip <laughs> onto that fabric, and hers, in return, would have been too heavy for us. Absolutely. And also with some of the 60s pieces, you think about the, the new colours of fashion too, as well as the new textiles and the new materials. Mm -hmm. um, you, do, you do get a whole sense of the fashion behind these pieces. And the architecture too, Someone like Daphne Krinos, these wonderful pieces are, are very evocative of the, of the building of London in the 80s and 90s um, as she experienced uh, the building scene. And you can see that in the sense of architectural construction of these pieces and the way that the pins disappear when you wear them. So the pin disappears behind the textile against which you wear it and you get this wonderful bold outline with these architectural jewels. And what's the stone? Is that an aquamarine? That's an aquamarine. Mm. Very pale aquamarine. They're beautiful, aren't they? Um, Dora, do you wear brooches yourself a lot? I do. I had to say I didn't before I started writing about them, and then I got really interested in them, started, when I could afford it, buying the old one for myself. Um, so this Joanne Thompson is a really lovely piece to wear. It's actually a pin, so it just pins onto anything, and it's very, very wearable. Um, but yes, I do have a small but growing collection. And it's very good to, as a curator, to own the odd thing yourself because it makes you understand the micro-engineering better. It gives you a real appreciation of what makes a good brooch. That's how you learn, isn't it? By Absolutely. handling these pieces and wearing these pieces. Absolutely. And some of the 60s people pieces still have this, this very radical look. Um, you know, this is a Jackson Pollock in gold uh, by Mary Kessel, who was a a woman war artist at the end of the Second World War and went to Belsen when it was liberated by the Allies at the end of the war, but then it became a sort of place of transition for people going back to their home countries. And the scenes that she saw there of people being reunited with their families or being reunited with other fellow nationals and being put onto trucks to take them home if they were wounded or weak, she was incredibly moved by what she saw. And she wrote a wonderful journal of it in the Imperial War Museum, did these beautiful drawings. I love to think that we're connected with those experiences through a brooch like this made in mm -hmm. 1961, which was a very special commission for the exhibition. It was quite a radical thing to ask, you know, some leading abstract sculptors to design pieces. So this piece by Robert Adams is one of the, you know, he's one of the great post-war abstract sculptors in Britain. And this is an abstracted floral corsage. So if you look at paintings of 18th century and early 19th century women, they're often wearing these floral pins, little sprays of flowers. And what he's done is take that idea with a scattering of three coloured diamonds and this, this selection of splayed out gold rods and just abstracted it to, to a completely modern piece, which you could wear, again, on almost anything, almost anywhere. So that radicalism is still very obvious in some of these pieces. Do you still commission artists and sculptors to make pieces? Not so much. We're, we're more concerned with 
excellence in precious metals. So we're getting people who've come through that particular route. But it might be something that would be interesting to really do. Really fun. I think it would be really fun to do that. We do have some amazing work by sculptors in the collection. Uh, we have wonderful little gold figures by Brianna Casey, the great sculptor. So these wonderful little birds. Um, for example, we have this little group of birds. I'm just putting one down on the table in front of you. Um, he was a great mm. jeweller who was also a very fine sculptor and a printmaker and a maker of text. I mean, there's nothing he couldn't do, really. Mm, mm. Um, so we do already have this range of work in the collection. And I have to say that as experiments in form, I think our jewellery does very well. And I guess it's not a given that somebody working in a different medium can turn their hand to jewellery. Not at all. You can mm. see it was quite a strain for some of these people in 1961 to make a design in wax which was then cast by Grima's experts at H.J. and Co. Um, a lot of these people were brilliant bronze founders but they weren't capable of, of making the transition to jewellery. And there is a slight awkwardness to some of these pieces. So making something wearable and problems of scale can often be quite difficult, I think, for artists. Um, and the silversmith's work is incredibly varied. I've just got a selection out here but we've got a masterpiece of engraving by the great engraver Malcolm Appleby in white gold. So this is the Millennium Casket that we commissioned to hold packets of wildflower seeds uh, in little packages so that different members of the company could take the packages out, scatter seeds all over the country to celebrate the Millennium. And it's a really lovely piece made out of white and yellow gold uh, with a moonstone, Cabochon moonstone in the lid and the imagery, which is engraved absolutely all over it, is of the moon drawing the tides of the oceans. So here is the moon in this cabochon uh, moonstone with its incredible energy drawing the seas to it. And you can see the sun rising and setting over the water. It's a very Malcolm Appleby piece, a masterpiece by him. Um, so we have that, and then we have another incredible masterpiece by Michael Lloyd, who is one of the great chasers on gold. So this is to celebrate the Queen's Golden Jubilee, a commission from us. With a, It's a, a little vase which is fluted form. And the chasing is really like a form of drawing on gold, which is incredibly soft. If you feel it in your hands, you can feel how soft that is. Very soft. And, and what's the inscription? The inscription going around it is taken from Queen's speech when she was still um, a princess, uh, where she dedicated herself to her peoples. And it starts here. My whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. Which is a rather lovely message mm, to read now. Is. And then we were all talking about marks, marks at the bottom. The marks, very typically for Michael Lloyd, are used as part of the design on the base. So there's a mark for gold. And that's his sponsor's mark, his maker's mark. Um, the Golden Jubilee commemorative mark, the date letter, and the finest mark for the gold, 22 karat gold. So... There's a whole series of stories in that one piece. Did you have a special platinum jubilee mark this year? We had a commemorative platinum jubilee mark that was designed and used here at the hall. Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's on the Queen's, the replica of the Queen's brooch here. It's very small here, but you can, perhaps you can just see it. We need to get you a glass so you can see that. Mm. So people can look at the exhibition online? We will have 20 highlights online, which we'll describe in some detail, and you'll be able to get really close to those pieces. And the um, fair, will that be online as well? Can, you can see the maker's work online? You'll be able to see this selection of 20 pieces online, mm -hmm. yes, on the fair website. Um, it's a really important thing for us to get people a bit closer all over the world for free, wherever they are. Mm -hmm. um, and it's part of our wish to share our collection online. We want to put the whole collection online for our 700th anniversary. That's a major undertaking, but we're having this fantastic campaign of new photography and we're going through and uh, cataloguing all the pieces. Ready. When will that be, the 700? 2027. Okay. So, so that's quite a bit of work to do, Dora. <laughs> it's a huge <laughs> amount of work, but very enjoyable. A fantastic way to get to know the collection. And, you know, just to get close to these pieces is, is a wonder. So some important careers were launched with the 60s exhibition. Absolutely. Um, like Donald Grima, who came to the four... Well, I think many, many jewellers who we can follow mm. through from the very beginning of their work. Um, Wendy Ramshaw is a very good example. John Donald, Grima, another. 
Um, but other people that we've followed through their careers very faithfully, Daphne Krinos or Jacqueline Ryan, just looking at the pieces here. Um, and we've, we've got Jo Hayes Ward, we followed from mm -hmm. her very early years. Charlotte de Silas, we followed from her student years when she was studying with Gerda Flöckinger. Um, and the work of these amazing immigrants at Gerda Flöckinger being one of them. Mm -hmm. um, we have extraordinary capacity to follow from the very earliest into their mature years. And now you're following and supporting a whole new section of young Jews like Melanie Eddy. That's right. Amifa Cole, whose ring I see over there. Well, this is a fantastic ring by Emma Foucault, uh, Caldera ring, uh, which uses lost wax casting to give a sense of a volcanic crater, uh, which you can wear on your hand. It's a massive ring. But it's it, a massive ring. It's a very powerful <laughs> heavy. statement. You know you're very wearing heavy. that. And it's the contrast of the smooth oxidised silver on the outside and this amazing gilded crater on the inside mm. that makes it literally an explosive piece. And um, this is the day when she's just been announced as the new curator of diaspora at the V&A Museum. That's wonderful. Um, which is great, isn't it? And it's an exciting new role for us to hold it. Very exciting new role for her. Um, so this ring will be on show. This will be on show, and she is exhibiting at the fair this year, the mm -hmm. first time. So that's very exciting. That's very exciting. Yeah. Now we're going to hear from Emma Foucault herself. Because I want to know, Emma, what it means to you to be part of the Goldsmiths Collection. It is an absolute honour, particularly with regards to the piece that the uh, curators chose from my, my work. Um, they chose the Caldera Ring from the Vulcan series, which is a series inspired by the void created by a volcanic eruption. This particular ring has an opulent, luxuriously textured interior, contrasted with the unassuming black and smooth exterior. As the Vulcan series was first showcased at the Goldsmiths Hall during my, my Getting Started course there in 2012, this acquisition is truly special for me and I am delighted to be a part of this important and historically significant collection. And Emma, can you tell us a little about your new role at the Victoria and Albert Museum? It's an inaugural role. Um, created by the museum to grow its African diaspora collections. Can you tell us a little about that, please? Um, this extremely special role grants me the opportunity to add to the colossal collection of pieces which maps the history of jewellery designing and making. The, the role is time sensitive and the most important thing is what I bring um, to the best jewellery collection in the world. Um, this will only be evident at the end of, of my time here. And so I'm very keen to get going. It's just amazing to be working with such an in incredible team of curators across the museum. And I, I just need some time for people to see what I'm able to add to the collection. And Emma, I wanted to know how influenced you've been by the design and craftsmanship of Ghana, where you grew up? That's a really good question. So I'm currently working under the supervision of the Asantehini's goldsmith. And the Asantehini, for anyone who doesn't know, is the king of the Ashanti. And the Ashanti have a very rich history. And, and one of that includes the relationship they have with gold as a material and also the way in which they pass on wisdom and knowledge through metalworks, especially gold and, and also historically gold was currency in the Ashanti region. And so there are gold weights made from brass in collections worldwide. I'm just in awe of how the pieces are more than the design, more than metal. There's so much wisdom and teaching and just the, the passing down of knowledge through generations in one piece. And, and until you understand the significance of a specific object, that can become, you, you can lose context with, um, you know, the context within which the, the um, object was created. And so I'm really fascinated by that, the storytelling, folklore, mythology, and how you can capture that in a beautiful object, whether it's made from gold or silver or brass or bronze. And so that is really inspiring because storytelling 
is very much um, something that I am fascinated by in my own work. Because I'm still learning under the um, my master goldsmith, um, I'm still a student, so I have a long way to go before the impact of this apprenticeship can be seen and felt in my own work. But um, I can say that there are elements that I already sort of been incorporating in my work unknowingly and so it's it's um it's all sort of predestined I suppose and I will be the only thing I can say is that in time it will be visible in my work and yes yeah, so it's, it's, it's really exciting Ghana has a very rich very very rich um history when it comes to adornment whether it's clothing whether it's jewelry objects of art um, around the home. So it's um, it's natural that uh, this is a part of my work and myself. Part of your work here is also sort of education and helping young um, makers. You do hold bursaries, don't you? We don't hold bursaries here, but there are bursaries at the fair. At the fair? Yes. Because I'm just wondering, for people listening, if they wanted to try and get involved, what's the best way for them? Well, through the, through the fair, there is a graduate scheme, which is a really important thing for young graduates. They get a bursary, a free place at the fair, um, and a bullion allowance, and that gives them a chance. And we can show through the 40 Years 40 Makers exhibition the impact that that has had on emerging makers. Um, Andrew Lamb and a number of others. Uh, but the Goldsmith Centre is our main place for education and, mm. and, of course, our apprentices are there. And we do work with our apprentices, sharing the collection with them at the beginning of their time, um, giving them the context for what they want to do themselves, introducing them to techniques and to makers. And that's a very important part of what we do. So that's one way we share the collection. And encourage young people into the industry. Absolutely. Uh, the Goldsmiths Centre does a fantastic job, it's 10 years old now, mm -hmm. uh, but we are very unusual, I think, in the numbers and quality of our apprenticeship schemes and training that we offer. And what would your advice be to a young maker now? What would you advise them as the best way forward in their career and design process? Well, I do think the Goldsmiths Fair is a very good thing to aim for if you are a young maker in this country. I do think trying to get represented there is, is a very good way to go learning as much as you can about the techniques, the different makers, what has been done in precious metal is a really important part of the training. And you can do it through our online exhibitions and books, but also the VNA has that wonderful website where you can just explore your way through what has been done in precious metal in the last 10 years. And I would have thought that would inspire anybody. I do think you have to look at what has been done. When you see someone like Joe Hazelwood reacting, I mean, she's maybe not explicitly reacting, but she's picking up something of this 60s idea and translating it into a contemporary mode through CAD. You can see the strength and the flow of those ideas. And people shouldn't be put off that they think that world is saturated. There are so many people and the competition is so fierce. There's always room for a new idea, isn't there? There's always room for a new idea. But you do have to have the skills and one of the things about our collection is it shows the importance of hand skills. Um, you know, knowing how to get your concept embodied in the metal, whether you're using hand, uh, traditional techniques or the very latest techniques. So I think that's a really important element. And for each person, it's getting the balance of the old and the new. So do you feel people should be apprentices for a while? I can't imagine anything better than being an apprentice mm. to a really established maker. I think you have to inhabit the tradition and make it your own in order to do something new, in order to leave it behind, in order to forget about it. Um, I think that's true, isn't it, of most things. I wanted you to describe this brooch quickly as well, which um, has a very interesting story for any women listening. This is a fantastic piece by Dorothy Hogg. Um, it's the spirit level brooch. And she made it at a particular point in her life um, really, it's, it's a fantastic piece. You have to wear it to really understand it. So this dates from 1993-94, when she was having to juggle her work as a silversmith, her teaching role. Um, she was a mother, and she was also thinking about her own mother, who was unwell at the time. And so it takes this form of... How would you describe that? 
It's like a very elongated eye in silver, That's a right. narrow elongated eye, and on it are lots of different hanging hoops, They're again all... in the same shape. Exactly, so the, there's a perfection, almost surgical precision by which it's made, because if you're doing something this simple, it has to be perfect. So if it's out of balance, all the, the um, what do we call the them? hanging elements. All the hanging elements will just rush down to one side, exactly. or the other. So it's about finding that point of balance. So when you wear it, and it has a special safety catch that she made herself because this is from her own collection for her own wearing, you have to move in such a way, in quite a conscious way, to keep all the pieces hanging in the right alignment. As soon as you get agitated and start throwing yourself around and behaving in an irrational or uh, impulsive way, they get jangled up. And I think that's, that's what she's communicating through this is finding that point of balance in a really, really difficult, challenging set of circumstances, which I think all women will recognise. I think everyone needs one of those brooches. <laughs> it, it is a seminal piece, and yes. people do talk about it changing their lives. I know Corinne Julius, um, who's on the Contemporary Craft Committee, she's a great wearer of one of these brooches, and, and she talks about how it, how it changes you. You think before you do anything. Yes, yes, it makes you thoughtful in our archives, the capacity to tell stories from the archives and with contemporary makers and go into contemporary workshops. It's that uh, extension of the tradition and showing how it flows into the present and showing how these objects are not just fantastic examples of goldsmith's work, but they're also stories about people. It's when you can connect people and things that, that it gets really exciting. And I think that's what's very special about the Goldsmiths Company's collection and the kind of work that we try to do and the way we want to share it with people. I think it's very different from a museum collection, which can never have quite that dynamic element that we can have. Thank you so much, Dora, and thank you for sharing it with us, giving us a sneak preview and allowing me into this haloed silver and gold vault. Oh, it's been lovely. Come again. Thank you for listening for this and other episodes of If Jewels Could Talk. Please go to our website, carolwalton.com slash podcasts. And you can find us on any of the usual platforms where you find your podcasts, where we'd love a rating and a comment. And join me again in two weeks for the next Jeweled Nugget when we're off to the ballet. I'll be talking with the historic French Maison Van Cleef and Arpels about their tiny pirouetting and twirling dance eclipse and fairies that they've created since 1941. We'll be discussing the art of movement in jewellery. So please join me then. Goodbye. If Jewels Could Talk with Carol Walton is produced by Natasha Cowan, music and editing by Tim Thornton, graphics by Scott Bentley, illustration by Geordie Labanda, and you can find me on Instagram at Carol Walton.